following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Tonight, we dive deep into the key nuances of what makes up land law in Sri Lanka. Disputes related to land law have taken very unfortunate turns over time in our country. How is the legal framework made up in Sri Lanka to govern matters related to property? How has it changed over time? And are these changes addressing the needs of the 21st century? Will we see cases related to land disputes reaching justice faster than in current status quo? And what is taking these cases so long to reach a conclusion? Welcome to Law, Land and Liberty, where we are keeping with the promise of bringing in a contemporary legal topic and breaking it down so that laymen can understand what's exactly happening within the legislature within uh, Sri Lanka. Now, today's topic is going to be on land law. And as you may know, as from your own experiences, it's a very vast field and it requires a lot of untangling given the kind of, you know, extreme vastness of this entire subject. And to do that, we have a very special individual, a senior lawyer, President's Counsel Nihal Jayamana. Thank you so much, sir, for spending your time with us. Uh, President's Counsel Nihal Jayaman is a past president of the Bar Association and he's the former chairman of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka, amongst a lot of other bodies that he has been leading and a very experienced litigant within, within our profession. Thank you so much, sir, uh, again, for joining us and giving us this time. As usual, we are going to give a small breakdown of the topic so that our viewers have a general understanding of where we are going with this so as to not waste any time. So firstly, we are going to talk a bit about what are the key statutes that are in play when, when, when we are talking about the land law that is governing our country. Secondly, we are going to talk about the types of property recognized in Sri Lankan law. Third, the common disputes and the uses of land law. And finally, court proceedings related to property. And we're going to talk a bit about how entire these time durations and all of that will occur. Hello, my name is Siddhar Vikramasinghe and I'm a law student. My question is about statutes governing land law. So what are the key statutes governing land law? All right. Once again, uh, Mr. Jayaman, thank you so much for coming and giving us this time. I think a very important topic you have with, with when you had spoken to the public, you have generally shown how there's a huge amount, there's a backlog, one would say, and then there's a huge mm. uh, there's a huge requirement for land law cases that just keep coming up to courts, and people really need an understanding of what they're facing when it comes to property issues. Now. In order to get some form of segue into this entire discussion, Ms. Jayaman, I, I thought of starting from uh, and asking you the question of, OK, what are the key statutes that a layman should be looking at, should be aware of when talking about land, when talking about your general possessions? Right. Um, there are a very old statute called the Land Development Ordinance. Land Development Ordinance, which is of great importance to people who are in the villages and in, especially in Amradapura, Poronnarua, and even up country places. That is because uh, the Land Development Ordinance uh, give grants and permits to the citizens of this country because during our king's times, nobody owned land, only the king owned every bit of land in this country. And it was his choice. Yeah. He used to give some land, not ownership, but in the guns to other in the lords who were the aristocrats at that time. And then they had given it to the ordinary people to cultivate. And then they had to do something called the Rajakarya. Okay. Means they have to give a portion of the produce. <coughs> and in addition, they had to do ra what, what's called Rajakarya. That is, they are every year, they have to do certain chores for the Ninda Lord. Like, for example, if the Ninda Lord is going out of his village, well, there were certain section of people who used to come <coughs> and stay with the, his wife and his children okay. to look after them on various things, very demeaning work sometimes, very demeaning. Okay. So, uh, 
and then the, there was the so that is how the people got land they didn't own it and the people who used to work the land and do the rajakarya were called the haraveni nirakaryas okay they are the people who actually own the land so uh, so that affects people now because the land development ordinance still is in operation what happened was after certain period the rajakarya was abolished and instead of doing menial work they were asked to pay some of money okay so that is how it stands so there was uh, so still a lot of people that's why in this uh, if there are some areas so there are no lands owned privately that means the deed the deed yeah, it yeah. is a grant and there are certain restrictions now for example the most controversial provisions in the land development ordinance is the provision in the schedule which says how it should devolve after the death of the person to whom it was given that is the grant was given now that that section says that it will go to the eldest son the the women the the, the daughters are excluded okay <coughs> because this is obviously a gender discrimination yeah. we have been trying i mean i was a law commissioner i mean in the law commission i was a law commission from 1994 okay and in it was in 19 2004 2010 that i became the chairman and uh, after i became the chairman i uh, we had committees and suggested amendments to bring this wrong you know do away with this wrong which was totally uh, gender biased so uh, but nothing happens nothing happens even today this law is in force which is observed yeah in the 21st century so <coughs> so uh, that affects people yeah. right from the whole world and they lost so i don't don't talk about anything prior to independence except land development ordinance because that still in force then after that even during the british times the rest of the lands which were not <laughs> actually private which were privately owned the privately owned properties are mainly maritime properties that is because during the dutch and the portuguese period certain people were given land completely without any conditions <laughs> so those lands now are governed by the roman dutch law okay. that is the general law of our country is roman dutch law <laughs> not not candian law or any single law it's a roman dutch law which is the common law of this country so the common law applies to all those lands um and invariably what happens is therefore because historically people of this country didn't own land so for them land was very precious right and they like to keep it within the family they kept it within the family so what happens is generation after generation it was in one family and after about two four two to four generations there was a whole heap of people who owned this land and it was owned in common everybody had a share in this land okay right now this created a situation where what is called common ownership came into existence in sri lanka common ownership is quite uh, was there in other countries but in sri lanka so then this created a problem because there was no development of the properties with everybody on the land yeah. i mean you couldn't mortgage it mm -hmm. to get any money from the bank it was 
unproductive in the sense of financially unproductive. Uh, the, the, the state brought what is called a partition act, an ordinance. Then there was a partition act mm -hmm. in 1950s and now there is a partition law. Okay. Now, the, the most common area of litigation is based on this partition law. Because everybody owns, so many people own land. Sometimes <coughs> hundreds of people own land. So what happens is one chap brings what is called a partition action. Partition actions are the most common action in this country. Go okay. anywhere in this country, in any district court, 90% of the cases, especially in the outstation, okay. are partition actions. Right. Mm -hmm. So that even today those partition actions are the most prolific actions. In okay. this country, the next statute which is important is the Rent Act, which is now yeah. fading into not that important because uh, the new new houses after eighty two or something like that, which have been rented out or built. The rent act does not apply. Okay. <coughs> and the condominium properties, they don't apply. So that is now becoming a bit not that important. Yeah. I'm not, not saying that it is not, yeah. but it is not that important like the those days. Then, in recent times, there was this condominium property. Yeah. So the law with regard to condominiums. That has become important. That is very important because a lot of people, lots of people, they don't know what. But what what you go and buy an apartment without knowing what you're you getting into. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and people in this country are not used to sharing things because when you go to a condominium, you're a part of a community. Yeah. yeah. You have to get on with the people. You can't be putting garbage all over the place. There is a and that is all governed under this specific. Yeah, that may, there must be, you know, say for example, a huge condominium. The uh, eastern wall yeah. of the condominium comes up with cracks. Yeah. You're on the western side. You're not affected by it. But still, everybody is responsible for it to put it right, because the whole building will be affected. Yeah. So now some people don't understand, why should I pay? It's going to cost millions. <coughs> why should I pay? Because I'm not going to get affected. Okay. So you must get out of that syndrome, uh, mindset, and uh, understand that it's a community, we must live to live. Then Together. they start fighting about parking lots. Yes. <laughs> uh, various things. but. Well, we are still new to this game, mm -hmm. so in time to come, all this will settle down. Yeah. Multiple topics that we need to take up, but we are going to we are going in for a very short break. You are watching Law Line and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council Nihal Jayaman. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council Nihal Jayaman. Sir, so, uh, we had to interrupt you when you were detailing us the statutes, the most relevant statutes and what is really functioning in uh, current status quo. If, you, if there are areas that you believe we should really focus on more, please feel free to continue. But within this segment, something that uh, 
I think you did actually enter this segment when you mentioned, okay, look, condominiums are present and <coughs> the and the legislature that governs them is different. Now, there are certain archaeological areas. There are certain areas that cannot be tampered with. There are certain uh, dis designated the uses for land that have been provided by the law. Give us a basic understanding of that, uh, Ms. Jaiman, how, how, does, how do we enter that entire, entire discussion? But, um, what affects most people would be the municipal laws. Okay. That is, uh, the, now, now it will be the UDA. Exactly. There is a zoning system for mm -hmm. in various municipal areas. There is the industrial, the commercial, the residential, and the mixed. And the mixed. So, uh, in a way, if your property is in a industrial and you won't be able to sell it for residential purposes. So like that, th these restrictions are there. And uh, you won't be able to, if, even if it is a good location, you won't be able to buy a piece of land and build your own house. That is good. Yeah. That's, that's very good because it, is, it has been there in other countries for a long, long time. It's good because you know what you are getting. You can't. You won't be next to a some factory which is making a big uh, 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 commotion. No, yeah. no noise. Uh, noise. Yeah. Or dust. Yeah. So you know where you are getting. Yeah. So those are municipal laws, right? And various municipalities will have their own zoning system and areas. Well, there are, of course, certain areas where you can't go, archaeologically important areas where you cannot even cut a tree. And then there is the wildlife, the... The, 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 the act on flora fauna. Yeah, yeah. Right. so you can't do anything there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the, of course, the, the seashore. Okay. And now you can't build after the tsunami. There's a distance. Uh, distance from the shoreline yeah. to the building area, that's where it starts. Yeah. So there are restrictions because those restrictions are based for the good of the community. Yeah. So you have to <laughs> yeah. you have to respect it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jayaman, I think something that you have that we want to speak <coughs> about is this possibility of fraud. In, in, in the midst of all of this. Now, uh, does it connect to, now we want to really take a separate conversation itself on the common disputes that you're faced on yeah. a daily basis as uh, lawyers, why you have to go to courts pertaining to land issues. But when it comes to fraud, now the reason why I want to take it up now is that the registration process has a lot to do with this. Mm. And that the registration is where the allocation of lands for mm. basic purposes happen. Uh, how does it exist within our system? I don't think a lot of people are really aware of it. Um, as I told you, the importance of land for the people of this country. <coughs> Therefore, there's always been fraud, yeah. land fraud. That is, the deeds are forged. Okay. Or deeds are written using force. Last wills are forged. Forced, uh. So, uh, but now in recent times, in the last maybe 15, 20 years, it has reached a, a, a proportions which are un, un, unimaginable. Okay. Unimaginable. I mean, you know, I may not know, or you may not know whether you are the owner of your land because somebody might have uh, executed the fraudulent deed and he might be the owner. Okay. It has come to that because there is a connivance between the lawyer, the notary, the fraudster and the land registry itself. Okay. Right? These three uh, People in these three, three, three places must get involved, or at least two of them must get involved. 
the lawyer sometimes is not aware of it yeah. now this is the problem why is the lawyer not aware of it that is because the lawyer is not diligent enough there is a very important aspect to any transaction the lawyer must know its customer when somebody comes and says i own this land and your client is buying it the the the, the you have a duty towards your client to find out whether this chap actually owns, owns it you can go to the land registry and look at the <coughs> registers yeah. and find out whether it is true so if a is the seller and b is your client you go to the land registry and find out whether a is actually the owner you find that a is actually the owner according to the deed and also the register yeah but you don't know whether b uh, sorry a s deed is a forgery yeah forgery or not yeah so therefore you have to go beyond that you have to be sort of do a little bit of detective work yeah to find out whether it is whether actually a is the owner okay right so that uh for that the uh, the provisions of the notary ordinance is inadequate okay and i was appointed as a chairman of the a committee to look into the notary ordinance and suggest amendments and we have we sat for many years and amidst lots of opposition from the lawyers themselves because <coughs> we formulated a superb bit of legislation which would have reduced the um opportunities for fraud okay now for example biometric signatures that is we suggested that when you sell a property you not only sign your sign it the deed but also put your thumb impression okay we also said that even the buyer should sign and put his thumb impression so that the subsequent buyer <laughs> will actually know whether this is actually the person who says he is okay <coughs> but tell us about what the current mechanism is also like what, what is it we but don't do that now nothing mm-hmm. okay so how it is that nothing then that there, there is also we said that you have to have photographs okay a notary must take a photograph of the man who's selling and buying yeah. and keep it in his custody okay so that if when if if there is a problem he'll have to say I did take a photograph. This is a photograph of the man who sold it, yeah. and this is a photograph of the man who bought it. Okay. Right. Now that is that would reduce the, or discourage a lot of people from doing these things. These are not new things, which are new, which are observed in other countries because for land fraud is not restricted to people to countries like Sri Lanka. it's they are everywhere right so uh, unfortunately like most suggestions which were made when we were at the, in the law commission and when we were in committees have not been implemented they don't even they don't even know mm-hmm. whether they have been like that right so much so that they are appointing new committees to look into the matter all over again okay so there is the <coughs> the presence of vacuums is something that you have highlighted ms jaiman i have to interrupt you again there we'll i think a lot of more details that we need to get from you uh, we'll go in for a very short break you're watching law land in liberty we are in conversation with president's council nihal jaiman stay with us Hello 
my name is Priya Jain. I'm a student at Columbia University. My question is about common disputes. What are the common disputes arise that regarding land matters? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Counsel Nihal Jaiman. So a very informative few sections that we have passed by and this within this segment I won't really cover the common disputes as lawyers that you would be facing when it comes to courts. Um, prior to which, I think we were talking a bit about fraud, we were talking a bit about the registration aspect of this. Anything else that you believe we should add on those on, on, on full as remarks? There is something called in the developed countries, title registration. Okay. That is, uh, <coughs> when somebody's title is registered, the register is sacrosanct. In, that's it. If you go to the register and you find that my name is there for a particular lot of land, yeah. that's it. Nobody can question it. Yeah. And if there is a fraud, which is very unlikely, that in spite of that fraud, the person who bought it will get title. Because in the register, the fraud is re um, recorded and register is sac sacrosanct. Yeah. So if my name was there, and now it's your name which is there, you are the owner because the register says so. And if there is a fraud, the government guarantees compensation to me to protect the register. Okay. <coughs> so that's a system which want which uh, the government wanted to, the then government wanted to bring in to Sri Lanka, which is totally against our sort of you know the way we do things. Yeah. But the uh, Registration of Title Act mm -hmm. was uh, pa brought in 1995. Yeah. 1995. Now, what? How are we going to do this? Because in places like Australia, it is 100 years ago. That's how they started. Okay. They blocked out the lands gave them lot number such and such yeah. and they had a register starting with the first owner and that's fine but now here there are <laughs> first owners there are lots of land mm -hmm. lot means plots of land where the title to which is not definite okay. so how are we going to introduce title registration to this country so it's an elaborate process of uh, having what is called a cadastral plan. Okay. A cadastral plan is like a, <coughs> a plan, say for Sri Lanka, there'll be a cadastral plan, which means every block of land will be surveyed and a plan made. Okay. And if you put all these blocks of plans together, like a jigsaw puzzle, you'll get Sri Lanka, okay. right? So uh, first you get make a cadastral plan, and then uh, there is a commissioner and there's a whole heap of officials, various stages where you go into the village and find out from people who the owner of this land is. So I will claim it, somebody else might claim it, yeah. and the boundaries will be different, difficult, yeah. different. Yeah. So you are actually get st starting a terrible uh, disputes, yeah. which where, they, where there were no disputes, yeah. okay. right? So they will actually you're asking the people to litigate. Yes. <laughs> right. So anyway, there'll be a person who will go in with these claims and after the claims have been uh, uh, each claim is scrutinized he will come to a conclusion he this step is the owner 
certain person is given. And then give him a certificate. Okay. If his title is absolutely no, no disputes, be a first class certificate. Okay. If his title is not disputed, but he doesn't have a deed, then you'll get a second class. And it will become a first class after 10 years. Okay. Something like that. Right. Okay. <coughs> now the whole problem is that what happens to the guarantee of title by the state? So there has to be an insurance. Okay. Who's paying for this insurance? We are paying for it. Okay. So every time there's a fraud, you pay compensation to the person whose name was there earlier and it's going from the government consolidated fund or insurance fund, sorry, insurance fund. Yeah. So it won't work. It will only work if the integrity of the register is maintained. maintained. Yeah. If the register is not, nobody's going to believe it, yeah. it's useless. Sure. So in other countries, when you go into the register, your fingerprinted, your photo is taken, you have to write and say what you want, mm -hmm. and what are the registers you want to see. Mm -hmm. Then you go inside, only a few people are sent at a time, okay. and they are scrutinized, they are all cameras, and you will know exactly if there is a fraud, now who looked at this register when, mm -hmm. you see, so, but we don't have that, we don't have yeah. the, capacity to have all that. Mr. Jayaman, I, I think you are in a very good place to give an elaboration. Now, you have really portrayed to us where we can go from here, the vacuums that exist on a daily basis that are really creating all of these issues, mm. one would say. Uh, what, what, is it registra Is it the lack of a proper registration mechanism that we often meet in courts? Or is there, are there other issues that we are clearly not aware of, <coughs> or the public is not aware of when it comes there to There are land? lots of things which are, um, the public is not aware Now, recently, there is a, what is called electronic transactions. Okay. Right? All of a sudden, there is an act which is brought in, and you are supposed to comply with it. Electronic signatures. Nobody knows. Lawyers don't know. Hmm. We, we don't know. Okay. So I think, to be fair by the public, that other Dirana yeah. take the lead mm -hmm. and have a, another session, yeah. maybe with two, two, one or two other people to discuss, maybe one from the central bank or mm -hmm. <coughs> and lawyers and very necessary, the registrar of lands mm -hmm. and the survey general. Okay. So all these gentlemen, because they are very, very good, mm -hmm. one of the best officers I have come across mm -hmm. in government departments rather is in the, the land registration aspect. Land registry okay. and the survey mm -hmm. department. So we must get in them, them involved. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, you will initiate yeah, we can definitely uh, take Initiate that discussion. another up program here. because uh, this is not, uh, it's not sufficient to go into yeah. all these uh, things yeah. in this program. Yeah. Uh, in On that, <coughs> uh, Mr. Jayaman, if, if I could, uh, now, something that you have uh, spoken about and we have also really heard is the is this concept of first principles. And you mentioned that there are these first principles that govern specifically when it comes to property and when it comes to land uh, law matters. Could you give us a certain elaboration on that? Because uh, the question, you know, most people would be okay, aware, okay, like if there's a dispute in ownership, mm. that would be what mm -hmm. a lot of people would be aware of when they mm. consider mm. land issues, when someone says land issues. But what are the other things that you know we should be aware of? You see, I am uh, generally making a general statement the general knowledge yeah. on land law or any other law in this country very poor. Yeah. And it is across the board. Whether you are a, whether affluence has nothing to do with it. In fact, I think uh, the people who are <laughs> uh, affluent yeah. are more ignorant than the villagers. Because they are aware of the land, because they are living in the land, and they, they face it rights. on a daily basis. I'm amazed sometimes at the 
when I speak to some people, the lack of knowledge yeah. of basic principles of land law. Yeah. It's nothing to do with that. It's not their fault. Yeah. They are not, they don't have the problems. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They don't have the problems. <coughs> so anyway, they should know. Yeah. Everybody should know something about your land mm. so that you can yourself protect it. Yeah. And ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, these programs, yeah. what you're doing now, yeah. and I hope the other program, will actually uh, help the general public to get to know what yeah. the law is, which is very necessary. Yeah. Uh, and also, that you told me about it. Now, apart from the ownership, yeah. pure ownership, whether I own this land or not, yeah. there are certain things which are attributes of ownership. Yes. When you own a land, you have certain inherent rights you acquire with the land. For example, there is no, no, um, point in having a land yeah. if you don't have access to it. Okay. Yeah. You have to have access to the land. From a main road, mm -hmm. from a public road to your land to go in and go out. Yeah. If you don't have that <coughs> well you can't go in or come out. Yeah. So there is this rights of way. Very important these days because lands are being divided into such small lots in the suburbs, right, and even in Colombo, so that sometimes some people have no rights of way. There are some, some people's rights of way have been encroached. Mm -hmm. So rights of way have become very very important. Okay. Right. Then there is in, there are encroachments. Okay. You have your property. The next property, the fellow who bought, buy, buys it, he builds a house, and you find later on that he has encroached to one or two feet or six inches even. To your area. <laughs> to your area, and yeah. six inches a long strip, it's maybe a half a foot, yeah. yeah. which will be 10 million yeah. Yeah. in certain areas. Yeah. So it will be, become in encroachments. Right? Then also, right to air and light. Okay. Supposing you, you, you are peacefully living in your land, your next door neighbor sells the land, and some fellow puts up a huge building, condominium or otherwise, and you are now, not a breath of air comes into your house. Your house is dark. Yeah, yeah. Right? So those are also, there are, there are rights. Rights interested in the law. <laughs> When you when you talk about positions, yeah. So yeah. you have to you have to be aware of those rights. Yeah, you have to be aware of those. That's why I said it is very necessary to know something about what your ownership means. Yeah. After he builds a house, there's no point in going to a lawyer and then litigating. Before litigating, you have to do. But people are definitely getting more and more aware of all these yeah. things. Yeah. And uh, of course, position. Mm -hmm. Position is the main reason why you are the owner of the land. Yeah. If you are not the holder, you can't possess. Yeah. I mean, you can unlawfully possess. So if you lose possession, and some person comes and possibly or otherwise comes and enters the land, and possesses the land, your land, as if he is the owner. Uninterrupted possession of 10 years, he will get independently owned. of any other person, which means that you have not acknowledged the right of the other person. Yeah. Then he acquires prescriptive title. Right, right, right. Which is a very, very old concept. Mm -hmm. Some people think it is immoral. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's debatable. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Ms. Jaman, I have to again interrupt you. We have <laughs> to go in for a short break. I think we are in a very good position to talk a bit about what the court proceedings are, and I want to take that up within our next segment. Uh, Ms. Jaman, let's just uh, take a very short break on this. You are watching Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Counsel Nihal Jaman. Stay with us. court proceedings. How does court proceedings related to land law take place? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council Nihal Jaiman. This is our last segment. Uh, so one of the most important questions that the public wants to know that is being discussed but really not people are not aware of you know what the underlying causes are is the delays when it comes to court proceedings. Now we touched on the issues, the general issues when it comes to ownership and and as you mentioned it's a very vast area, a lot of areas that we need to touch on. What does a court proceedings for land related disputes look like? Where are the delays? Where How, how does it proceed forward? Unfortunately, um, land cases and, <coughs> and in uh, particular partition actions yeah. take a very, very long time. Yeah. You can't blame only the lawyers. I'm not saying that the lawyers are not without blame. You must blame the litigant itself. Yeah. And also the courts. Okay. The courts, the diary in the courts, it's so loaded that uh, the dates given for trial, maybe six, seven months. Yeah. <coughs> but Laws delays are a, as an issue and it discourages people actually going to courts. People going to courts. You can actually uh, finish a case in one day. Actually, if you really, if you are really, you know, if you are a good lawyer, you can. Okay. And it, because you see your case, and you know what your case is about. Not that I'm saying something about myself to just to draw, to make a point. Yeah. Then you say there's a dispute with your neighbor over an area of about two or three purchases of land. Now you should be able to tell your client, look here. This case is going to take a hell of a long time and it is only two or three purchases. Right? I know it's valuable. Yeah. <coughs> so you speak to the other lawyer and tell him, look, can't we come to a common, settlement, common ground, com yeah. compromise? You speak to the clients and the clients are also reasonable and the judge plays an important role and advises the client. <coughs> but the <coughs> initiative must come from the lawyers, the lawyers. one of the lawyers. Yeah. So actually lots of cases have been settled within the first or the second day. Mm. And also there is this um, old <coughs> story which might not be uh, true but it's worth telling there was this uh, in outstation courts there was this lawyer and uh, his son passed out as a lawyer and after about the when the son had practiced for about a year he gave him a case and said son Mm -hmm. Here is a case. We look after this case very, very well. <coughs> so in the evening, the son came home and told his father, some very good news for you. Uh, 
this case which was going on for 30 years, I finished off it. I finished it off today. <laughs> the father got really mad with the son. You know, fool. <laughs> Do you know that your education, your sisters and your brother's education was all paid for by this case? And you have gone and finished, finished off it. What? Where I be? Where I gave it so that you can keep it and <laughs> educate your children. <laughs> right? So like that, I mean, that may be, but it is true. I have, I have come across cases. I have appeared in cases at the beginning of my career. It was 30, 40 years old. It was actually older than me at that time because I... <coughs> so that is bad. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Jaiman, if I may interrupt you, is it the backlog of cases now, if you leave the role of the lawyer aside and we talk about, okay, if we are pretty much committed to doing this fast. Is it the backlog of cases or are there certain technical difficulties within land law itself that uh, creates yeah, this sort yeah, of delay? Yeah, there are technical. In partition actions, there is a technical difficulties. Okay. Because, now say for example, <coughs> say 30, 30 parties to a case, yeah. which is not, which is not, uh, it's quite common. Now there is this rule, which is a good rule, that when a person dies, the case stops yeah. until a substitution is made okay. on his behalf. Now every time a case is taken up, it so happens that one fellow has died out of these 20. Mm. Okay. So the case is postponed All right. okay. for substitution. Now that takes a long time. time it takes another year or two. And when that substitution is made, another person. And, another, and it takes a trial, another person. Those are those. Then <coughs> in a partition case, you can come into the case, can be added as a party at any time before judgment. Right? If all the claims must be looked into in a partition action. All of a sudden, when the case is at a tail, tail end, some chap can, I also want, I also have right. So he is added. Of course, he has to be cost. So the, like that, it goes on. Now, I, long ago, I think 1990s, I was in a committee to look into this partition law yeah. to make amendments. One of the amendments which I suggested was <coughs> that at the beginning of the case, yeah. Every person, the plaintiff and the defendant, along with his plaint and the answer, also submits a memorandum okay. saying, if I die during this case, I nominate so three so people yeah, okay. in order of my choice. One, two, three. And they must be substituted in my place. All right. Right? That would streamline the process. So that is, there, there is no question of it going down. You, you, you just... Hmm. <coughs> put that because it's his choice. Yeah. After all, it is much better for me to decide who should carry on this case and I At decide when I'm alive. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Jaiman, I think a lot of important details that you have given there, but unfortunately we are running out of time and we'll have to end the discussion there, but certainly there are a lot of a lot of other nuanced topics that we need to take up with you. Thank you so much, though, for joining us. We were in conversation with President's Council Nihal Jayaman, who's the past president of the Bar Association and a former chairperson of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, on that note, it is quite evident that land law is an intricate subject matter with a vast field of study. However, it is one of the most important aspects of the legal framework in our country. Daniel Alexander Brackens, a German-born political scientist, captured the essence of the fundamental need to have a strong land and property legislature in his book, Private Property, Law and the State. He states, property rights are the foundation necessary to explain the role of non-aggression. In other words, the non-aggression principle is simply another way of saying individuals have a right against aggression from others as a result of property. That is all from us here at Law, Land and Liberty. If you had missed today's program, you can watch the entire episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Join us again next week as we break down a contemporary legal topic. I'm Dadi Tanwasa. Have a great night.